I'm Karen Pushel Siegel. I'm a former diplomat and until last year co-chair of the International Affairs Forum in Traverse City. No administration likes criticism or having watchdogs looking over their shoulders, but these issues typically do not become front page news. That changed recently when President Trump removed five inspectors general over a period of six weeks, including most recently at the US Department of State. So that led us to ask, who are the inspectors? What do they do? And why is this issue important? We are very fortunate to have someone with firsthand experience right here in our community. Marsha Curran is a civil servant who worked in both houses of Congress and other government agencies, including 12 years as a senior inspector for the Department of State. With her late husband, Ted Curran, a senior US diplomat, she spent almost 30 years representing the United States abroad under often challenging conditions in such places as Yemen, Afghanistan, Lebanon, Jordan, Morocco, Germany, and Mexico. Marsha, thank you so much for helping us understand this really important issue. And we're glad to have this conversation with you. Thank you, Karen. I'm very delighted to be here. I'm a great fan of the IG system in the United States government, and I look forward to trying to explain it to everyone who might want to hear more about it. Great. Well, why don't we, to start with, why don't you just draw us a picture? So at its core, what is an inspector general? An inspector general is an independent official of the US government, usually always assigned to a particular agency or a group of agencies. And the first ones were named in the late 1970s, early 1980s. And they were all, um, I, I believe, representing different major cabinet departments. And after that, they expanded the number of IGs and some of them uh, are called are in a different category and they, but they all act the same way. They are independent. They are supposed to be totally um, objective and nonpartisan in the work they do. And this is a very important aspect of their um, work. And they, they run usually a, a large group of people who do inspections, they do audits, they do investigations like criminal investigations and they do reports to the Congress and to the president and to the, in the relevant committees of the Congress are, are really the ones that are very interested in this because their role is to really do oversight. The US government is extremely complex as we all know, it's quite large and we can't depend, and the congressmen know this, they can't depend on their ability staff abilities to keep track of what's going on in those departments and make sure that there's no waste, fraud, and abuse. And so that's, it's, it's really the eyes and ears of the Congress and the American people on how the government works. So it's okay, very so, important. Excuse me. So, so it, that means way, that in, in every system. federal agency today, there is an inspector general system that is basically acting as a watchdog for operations, looking for abuse, malfeasance, uh, making sure that our taxpayer money is being spent in the best way possible. Is that, is that what they do at its essence? Pardon? Is that its essence? That's what they're supposed to do. And um, if they're really good, and a lot of them are very good. And I, I must say my experience working uh, in the State Department Inspection Corps, uh, I was very pleased at the kind of work we were able to do. Um, but I wanna say in, in response to some of your comments, there's a Senator now who said the IGs are really how we drain the swamp. And, and so that, I think that's a thing for people to remember because you're not gonna be able to depend on either political party to drain the swamp. You need somebody who is independent and who is tough and fair and very objective. And that's what the IGs are supposed to be. Um, and in, in, in connection with that, um, their staffs are career civil servants and career foreign service people. So 
I think that's an important aspect as well. And those people always work for whatever government is in charge, but they also have rules that the Congress has put together and laws that have to be followed. And sometimes people don't want to follow those laws. You know how that is. And the, the danger is that the IG in question might be sort of captured by the, by the government in control. And we call this regulatory capture, regulatory agency. It means the people who are supposed to be regulated by them and control what happens. And it's not necessarily benefit of the American people. So I think draining the swamp is a good thing to remember. That's really what they're supposed to be doing. Okay. I think I've also read that somebody who was an inspector general, they, uh, perhaps this is a rosy picture of, of how it could be, but the idea that let's say that you're the secretary of housing or, or something like that, and, and you come into your office and you're trying to do the best job possible and you discover, oh my goodness, I have an inspector general who is there to uh, try to make sure my agency is working in the most effective way possible. I mean, at, at its heart, yes, that's it could true. be a cooperative um, fact, uh, arrangement. The uh, inspection corps in the State Department that I was a part of, the piece of the IG office there, had existed before the IG system was put in place throughout the whole government. And Okay, so the, the overall system, Marcia, then to summarize is, is there are inspector generals at every federal agency. Um, they are appointed by the president and they report to the president or they report to Congress. Just, just lay out the basics for um, who they report to and then we'll go from there. Well, the um, most of the initial inspectors general who were named after the passage of the General Act in 1978 were named by the president. And there were 12 of those. And then there were quite a few more that ended up being named also, I think, by the president. But after that, there was a whole group of IGs who were named by the head of the agency that they are inspecting. So there are two categories. So it's, we're sort of getting into the weeds here. I apologize mm -hmm. for that. But yes, initially named by the president. And um, they are supposed to be, I mean, this is what the Congress has in revisiting the act several times and even now recently is talking a lot about how to maintain the independence of these inspectors general. That is the thing they're most concerned about that they not be fired except for cause, that they not okay. be fired except for a really good reason. And um, when I was working at state in the IG's office, I was told that the um, IG's were named for seven years and that they were never supposed to be fired unless they did something really wrong, you know, and could be charged. So um, I don't know if that was in the original act or not, but that's what I was led to believe. And then in 2008, there were changes made that strengthened the um, requirement to name, some, to be sure that they were independent and that they were only fired for cause um, or for not behaving properly. And that has been, of course, not honored always by presidents, which is unfortunate. Um, and so now the Congress is again looking at this and the committee uh, that handles it in the Senate is very, is, has a bipartisan bill that they're working on to strengthen the independence of the inspectors general, which I think is very encouraging. Okay. Um, and the ranking, the ranking member on that committee, who's also a sponsor of the bill, is a Michigan senator, Senator Gary Peters. So I think we should be proud of that. Wow. Very. Yeah. So, so just to again summarize then, so there is broad, not a uh, nonpartisan agreement that every agency should have some sort of watchdog to make sure that our taxpayer money is being spent in the most effective way possible. There should be no abuse, but it also should be simply uh, be done effectively. 
So when, when you were at the State Department then, what, what were the sort of things that you were looking into? What was your, your work like? Well, in, in the Office of the Inspector General in the Department of State, there were several sections to that. One was our inspection corps, which was the part that was brought in, that existed before the act and was incorporated into this new setup. And the difference was that instead of just reporting to the head of the agency, that is the secretary of state in this case, the reports we did in the inspection corps was, were to, went to the congressional committees that cared about what we were doing, the two committees, one in the House, one in the Senate, and also to the White House, and of course, to the head of the agency, to the Secretary of State. So you can see in that pattern that the IG system is really uh, across the government, different parts of the government, checks and balances, and they're supposed to really serve all of those elements in a very effective way. And yes, waste, fraud, and abuse is a big thing, and they're supposed to use generally audit approved standards, which the General Accounting Office sets up for the United States. And so in um, the Aegean State, we had this inspection board, and we were supposed to inspect every post every five years, which wow. we said, we've got 150 posts or more out there. You wow. know, that's kind of a big job. And sometimes we might have come close to doing that, but really to have enough staff to do that and to do it well, was really a challenge, but that's what we did. So that in that sense, it was still used as a kind of management tool. And we did not play gotcha, as I said. Mm -hmm. um, we tried to keep our inspected entity informed as to what we were finding so that we could get answers. And they saw our report when we fin when in draft before we left the post, told us what we, they thought we'd gotten right and what we thought they thought we'd gotten wrong. And we argued about those things and maybe we took some of their suggestions and maybe we didn't. And then we went back and it was eventually finalized in, in, uh, in the State Department at the end. But it was a good process. Um, we, we were a little freer than the auditor group that the State Department has. The auditors might have, say, for instance, taken on a job of looking at how the State Department handled housing and all of its posts. But we went to posts and looked at how the post was doing its job, basically. And we covered policy implementation, not making policy, but whether they were implementing it the way it should be implemented. Um, and we covered management of, of resources pretty thoroughly. That was, those were the things that we were supposed to do. And, and, and what's Excuse me, was there a way then to measure over time uh, what you were adding to the process, how you were making things better? Yes, there were reports made uh, that are required, I think, by the Act to make uh, the, every IG has to report to the Congress every year on what they've been doing. So the, the Congress would, would see those reports and it would go to the White House as well. So. I think it's a pretty, a pretty good system. Um, Have, uh, most people then uh, acknowledge and work with you because they do see it as beneficial to making the government run better. Would you say that's the case or did you get grumbling from people that they had to do this? I don't think we got a lot of grumbling. You know, most people though are pretty busy. You've been at Post Overseas, you've got a lot going on, probably more to do you can manage. Um, so in a way we would interrupt those things. Sometimes we wouldn't go and inspect a post if something had happened at that country that was not, you know, that would make it really hard for the post to be inspected at that particular time, they would call off that inspection. But we always let people know what we were going to look at ahead of time yeah. as well. So, I mean, they could get ready for us. <laughs> yeah. And some of them were better at doing that than others, but, you know, we would, and we had a compliance system at the end where uh, the report was, I mean, we went back to the post after it was finalized and asked them how they were implementing the recommendations that we had made. And then we, so we have a regular dialogue with them on how 
how they were implementing those regulations and if they were. Mm -hmm. And and so why were you chosen as an inspector? What what did you bring to the job that they were looking for? <laughs> well, when I was hired, the State Department was just really beginning to hire up for um, for the uh, inspection staffing, and so they were they they announced several jobs actually about twelve I think, and I had already worked at State so that I knew something about the State Department internally and the different offices in the department. I had been a GS fifteen, which uh, was the top of the lower ranks of the service. As you know, there are super grades after that, and um, as well as the fact that I had lived overseas in embassies <laughs> and understood how they worked to some degree and saw it from sort of the inside day to day at the skunk factory, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so, we, um, so I think that was appealing to the people who were doing the hiring in, the, in, in that office at that time. Mm -hmm. So, so often you will have people who have experience working in that substantive area. You wouldn't take somebody who knows about health issues and have them inspect the State Department. I mean, there, there has to be some sort of beginning knowledge because it's, as you said earlier, government these days is very complex, it's very specialized, and uh, in, in order to make your process of inspecting efficient, you, you must have to know a little bit about what you're inspecting. Yeah, and it does help to understand how the department works and the fact that there are many agencies often at these posts. It's not just the State Department, it's a lot of other agencies at many of our posts. And to know something about them, I had worked in the Environmental Protection Agency before that in International Chemical Affairs. So I'd done some overseas work there and um, before I was hired with the IG. And also I had run this office in the State Department, so I had some management experience as well. And I think that was helpful. But they also hire, they hire people who are auditors. They mm -hmm. hired a num number of auditors. I was not an auditor, but I was trained in the audit process to do my work. And I ended up doing a lot of different kinds of pieces of the inspection, as well as managing the writing of the report. Mm -hmm. You must have uh, had to have been held in high regard and be respected by people. If you're going to go into an embassy and, you know, take their time and, and have them talk to you, they have to know that you have authority behind you, but that you are also somebody who they can trust. Well, and the other thing that we did was we, in, we did interview every American at the Post, basically. Wow. So, and all of these interviews were confidential. Hmm although they were, we recorded them, but they were confidential. So if somebody had something to tell us, like a tip about something that wasn't, shouldn't be going on, that was going on, or that they had been mistreated or whatever it was, they could tell us those things. And we could even, if necessary, if it was serious enough, ask that their rating officer do a new rating if we thought the last rating was not, was not uh, fair. Yeah, and we did have to do that a few times. So confidentiality and, and people feeling like they're not going to be retaliated against if they say something that was pretty important then? Very important. If we did not um, support or, or keep our confidentiality promises, we would probably not have been able to do our work. Certainly not well enough. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, 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 no, I'd like to add, I noticed that uh, the Washington Post in, um, you know, they, they uh, wrote up about six articles about the um, special I inspector general for Afghan reconstruction, um, who has done, I think, a superb job. His name is uh, Sapko. Right. And he, um, he is not revealing some of the identities of people that they interviewed to find out what was not working in, in the, that activity. And, yeah. you know, reported, and the Washington Post wants them to reveal who these people are, and I think that's all wrong. I mean, correspondents don't reveal their sources. I mean, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. I think people should understand that, that he's not trying to hide something. Right. 
Right. And so that sort of sounds, people, I think, will be more familiar with the idea of whistleblowers, uh, because obviously we've heard a, a lot about individual whistleblowers in, in the past few years, but it's almost like that, isn't it? If, if somebody feels like they are seeing something, uh, they, they should be able to report it confidentially, and that was important to your work as well? Absolutely, yeah. yes. And if somebody was reporting something to us that was significant and troubling, uh, and the person could easily be identified if we knew that, you know, if it's only one person who knew it or two people or something like that. We always would ask them if they really wanted us to reveal this information. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and it, of course, if it was criminal or something like that, we, we couldn't not right. do something right. like that. But, but at the same time, you, you can imagine how, how if everything is confidential, then, uh, you know, particularly in a hyper-partisan context, you can start thinking that it, it's all kind of attacking somebody. And, and so that, it goes back to the integrity of the individuals involved. And, and again, so how do the inspector generals work in terms of being nonpartisan and, and keeping themselves above the fray, so to speak, and so they are trustworthy? Well, I think some of them have probably have had to remove themselves from doing some of the jobs if there is a conflict of interest that certainly would be the case. Um, but I don't know of any cases where that has happened. I mean, I think it probably might have happened somewhere along the line since there are now 75 IGs in the US government, in the federal government. Um, but I think it's put together as a quite a good system overall. And certainly you're right. Um, people can question the credibility of anybody, but I found the people I worked with were excellent. Um, they cared about the role of the institution that they were inspecting or looking mm -hmm. at, and they wanted to make it better in a way that would be important to the American people, not necessarily to one part of the government or one political party or another. Right. Right. So most of the people who have been appointed, they're appointed across administrations. Uh, they're, they're not just appointed by Obama, appointed by Bush. They're, they're appointed. And, and, and I think I've also seen that they tend to, once, once you kind of have that mindset and that expertise, you might be an inspector in one area and then uh, become an inspector in another area as well, because you have established your, yourself um, and your abilities? Yes, yes. Yeah. And that's true. Okay. Several of them have moved around and they've been excellent. They've been yeah. excellent people. I could name a few, but I won't do that here. Right. Well, you mentioned uh, uh, John Sapko from the um, Afghanistan Reconstruction. I was just looking at his bio. It's, it's amazing. I mean, he, he has done arms control and chemical weapons with uh, Senator uh, Nunn, you know, ages ago to today where he's in Afghanistan. And, it, and it's, it's really impressive. You get this sense of a caliber of civil servant. If, you know, in some ways that's become almost a, a negative thing these days, but our government is filled with people people who are, are dedicated and hardworking. So true. Yes, that's yeah. really true. And it's, and they really suffer when their superiors are not doing what they really should be doing. Mm -hmm. so. so let's um, go back to the situation today then. Um, so we know that President Trump, he, he's known to be a, a little thin-skinned, but he certainly isn't the only president who has been perhaps unhappy with an inspector general. Um, so why is this current situation so unique? Well, it seems to be very unique because of how many five, as you mentioned in your intro, five IGs have been just sacked by this president? All of it, I mean, within the last, 12 months or less, I mean, that's a lot. And some of them were some of the most um, capable, excellent IGs who've been in doing this kind of work for multiple different presidents and have done excellent jobs. There is a council of IGs in the US government that 
gets together and sort of talks over how it can do its jobs better. And these two or three of the people this president has sacked are some of the ones most respected in that group. That does. So sound. has there, I'm sorry, has, has there been pushback then? I mean, since what, what are we seeing in terms of reaction from Congress or is it a bipartisan pushback? Um, what, what's the reaction? I think it's bipartisan now in the Senate because they really want to do something about it, which is interesting. Uh, of course, the House does as well. Um, they've, they've been having hearings. So uh, we'll see. I mean, they're ready to introduce this bill. Maybe they've already, I think they might have already introduced it in the Senate. So maybe we're going to get some more support for protecting the independence of the IGs, which is okay. really the big thing. So that's the, the key thing, is simply looking for ways of increasing their independence. Yes. And let me say this in that regard as well. Um, I think you, if you've been around the federal government at all, you know budget is a big issue. And every year, every part of the government ha it has to look at their budget and figure out how much they need and try to get it. Well. In most agencies, some parts of an agency might be sort of denied as much as they want more than another part of the agency. Well, the IG system, every IG that I know of has its own budget. In other words, in the State Department, the Secretary of State cannot glom onto any of the IG's budget. Mm -hmm. that so that gives them some independence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you, having been in the State Department, you'll understand that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So the, the bottom line of all of this is we have a very complex government, uh, one of uh, checks and balances, um, and the IG is one component of that. It's, it's probably good for all of us to think that there's somebody looking over our shoulders to make sure that we're, we're not only uh, doing the best job we can, but also that we're not doing anything wrong. Yeah. Um, and, and at its essence, I guess the, the IG system is aimed at, at doing that. It, it is. It's, um, it's an extra set of eyes that yeah. are very specialized in terms of the agency that they're covering, which a lot of the Congress can't really get up to speed on. You right. know, we, hire, we elect people for two years in the House and um, yeah. the Senate for six. I mean, you're not going to, you know, you move around on different committees, so you're always in a learning mode. And Yeah. I yeah. Think what you said is absolutely right. It's right. So there, there is a reason that we have a government that continues to fu function through every election uh, because, uh, yeah, they, they keep everything running. But, but they're only as good as the system and the people who are part of it. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Well, Marcia, would, please, would you like to add anything else? Well, in, in our teams, for instance, we would have... Going to an embassy, you have some specialized work going on. One of the most unique parts of the State Department is the consular, is the consular unit, right? I mean, nobody else does consular work. Explain know. that to people what the consular is. It, it means giving, doing the visas, doing citizen services. Yes, yeah. okay. all of those things that, you know, that's where you go if you're in trouble overseas and you need some help from the federal government. You go to the consular section. Hopefully right. there's one nearby. <laughs> or you, you lose your passport, your whatever right. it is, you know, that's, that's what they do. And no one else in the government does that. <laughs> it's, it's one of the most unique things the State Department does. Um, so we always had a consular inspector in our, when we went to an embassy because they knew this, the ropes. Um, we had administrative inspectors and we had political economic reporting inspectors, as well as usually a a former ambassador who was career hmm. and cared a lot about the, you know, the service and, and how, how the embassy worked. So we had those kinds of specialized talents going in our team. And that was invaluable for doing the work that we did. So, mm -hmm. Right. And I'm sure others are the same, you know, right. they'll, they'll have engineers and so on in some, parts of the IG system that need them. I mean, you know, maybe it, 
FAA or, what, you know, the uh, um, transportation department, who knows? I mean, they must need a lot of different kinds of specialized talent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that, yeah. I, I think it's a very good system and I'm glad we've got it. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Marsha, you have helped for us today to put a human face on what it means to be an inspector. And I think that's really important for people to understand what we're talking about. It's not a faceless bureaucrat. It is somebody who cares deeply about her government and about the governance and is willing to spend your life uh, making sure that it is the best that it could be. So thank you very much for all of those years of service and for your continuing involvement. Thank you for asking me. I love talking about it because I think yeah. people need to understand it. Yeah, and yeah. feel good about it. It's a good part of the government. Right, right. And in fact, as I was doing research, getting ready for this, so much is online. I mean, anyone could do a deep dive. It's all very transparent and you could look at uh, the background of indi individuals. You can even read the reports. There's even listings of all the reports that, that they're planning on doing. And so you, you really get a sense of, of the how complex our government is, but, but also that there are really positive things going on. Yes. Did you read the um, Senator Grassley statement in the Senate? where he said that um, even in this year alone, in 2020, the IGs have saved the government $20 billion already. Wow. Wow. And that's probably just, you know, a small part of what they've done. So, and he is a Republican senator then? And, and he's, he's, a, he's a defender. Yes, he's a Republican and he's a defender of, of the IG system. I mean, he feels very personally connected with it. Yeah, yeah. Again, I, I, I think that simply underscores that it really is a nonpartisan issue. It's whoever is interested in, in supporting good governance. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, I hope that somebody uh, who might pick up this interview might say, oh, golly, that might be an interesting career to go into and uh, look into it more. There may be a future Inspector General listening uh, right now that you will have inspired, Marcia. So thank you very much for that. And thank you very much for um, helping us understand this complicated issue. Thank you. You're very welcome. Okay. Yeah.